Okay. Is the mic on? Yes, it is. Okay, I'll, I'll, um, I'll kick off, I think. Um, okay, hello, everybody. I'm David Lee, and I've got the job of being last, which means you're all completely exhausted or sunburned or something, and probably, probably don't want me to go on too long. So I'll try not to be too lengthy, and I'll try not to be too boring. Um, and if I am too boring, please sleep quietly. Um, I'm a journalist uh, from England, but I'm basically a civilian, really, in the world of offshore. You're all experts, and I'm not. I run investigations uh, at The Guardian uh, into crime, bribery, that kind of thing. Um, and I didn't really know a whole lot about offshore until a few years ago when I was in the middle of a, a lengthy investigation into a giant arms company, uh, BAE Systems. They're the biggest arms company in Britain, one of the biggest in Europe, a very big player in America. And uh, they got where they are today, amongst other things, by paying very large sums of money to people to get arms contracts across the world. And at one point in this investigation, I found myself sitting in Ireland eating oysters with one of their confidential agents, um, who produced to me for the very first time something which is like gold dust if you're a, <coughs> a journalist. It was some Swiss bank accounts. And what they showed was that BAE had been paying money to this person, and indeed, as it transpired, to all their agents around the world, um, via a couple of BVI companies. One was called Red Diamond and one was called Poseidon Trading. And the funny thing was, when I went back and looked up the company records for BAE, there was absolutely no mention of the existence of either of these two subsidiaries, even though British company law requires it. Uh, and it turned out that they had simply calculated correctly that nobody policed British company law and they could get away with not declaring them. And because the BVI was such a successful secrecy jurisdiction, uh, they could use these two companies um, to funnel hundreds of millions of pounds, about a billion dollars in total was eventually identified, going to middlemen and then all over the world. <coughs> and what we're talking about here isn't some two-bit fly-by-night fraudsters. We're talking about a huge international company with an important corporate reputation, um, somebody who you would imagine would be extremely respectable. So that was my first introduction to the world of BVI secrecy. What has happened since then, uh, and which I found particularly interesting, is that the world of offshore secrecy, particularly in the BVI, has now taken a big blow. And I've been involved quite centrally in a pretty pioneering journalistic enterprise uh, which has gone some way towards stripping away the secrecy which is the stock in trade of many of these offshore centres, particularly the ones that are British dominated or British controlled. And therefore, my theme uh, this afternoon is that the offshore secrecy, which is that stock in trade, can no longer be guaranteed. There may be people here who will disagree with me, uh, and it may be that I'm being overambitious in saying that, uh, but certainly at the moment I think it would be a very foolishly optimistic person who thought that <coughs> the walls of secrecy remained in place around places like the BVI. And the reason is quite simple. Since big data came into existence, since huge databases came into existence, which has been <coughs> the result of unstoppable technological developments, um, that data is going to leak. Once it becomes in existence, it's bound to leak. Once it leaks, this kind of data, very slippery, at the click of a mouse, it can be circulated around the world, it can fall into the hands of 
the wrong people, and the wrong people as far as many offshore operators are concerned are journalists like me. Um, let me take you back a couple of years. Um, just this is where we got to a month or so ago. We were in a position where we, when I say we, I mean the Guardian newspaper and our international colleagues in the ICIJ, which I'll talk about a, a little bit, um, were able to publish pretty well simultaneously the names of the people behind the companies, the names of the people hiding their wealth. Um, and this is what I think is the crucial achievement <coughs> which will damage, if not destroy, the concept of offshore secrecy. Now, back that couple of years to July 2010. This is really how it all started. WikiLeaks, I'm sure all of you recall the international furore about WikiLeaks. That's Julian Assange, uh, behind, who was behind WikiLeaks, holding up a copy of The Guardian when we ran the first phase of a worldwide coordinated simultaneous publication of a massive data leak. In that case, the leak was of US government information. It came from a soldier, a private soldier, Bradley Manning, who was stuck out in Iraq and who, <coughs> thanks to the existence of huge databases and thanks to the existence of some very poor security, was able to get his hands on uh, thousands of files of war incidents from Iraq and from Afghanistan, a video of uh, an Apache helicopter shooting up some civilians who turned out to be Reuters employees in Baghdad, and most 